As the U.S. Department of Energy mission is shifting from remediation, what does that foretell for the potential economic impact on this region, and what would you propose? <gasps> oh, I'm so ready to go. Yes, Courtney. Oh, you got three minutes. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Well, thank you, Annette. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dan Newhouse. Appreciate the invitation to be here with you tonight. I think it's very important that you extend that invitation. I think it's very important that I accept to be here to visit with you to talk about some of the reasons that I want to continue serving you and representing you in our nation's capital. So a couple of things. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to do so, to be your representative. It's a huge honor. It's one that I do not take lightly. It's something that it's a huge responsibility, as you can imagine, representing almost 750,000 people is not a small task. It keeps us running. It really does. Uh, but it's a huge honor, and it's one that, that I am very grateful that I have. I want to thank you for being a partner with me in helping to solve the challenges that we face as a nation, which are many and are huge. Things like our, our, our relationship with countries around the world and thinking adversarial relationships like China, like Russia, like Iran, North Korea, the hotspots around the world. Literally, you can say that there are places that are on fire around the globe that the United States has to pay attention to. The economy, inflation touches every single American. The cost of living is going up. The, the value of real wages is going down. That's unsustainable. One of the things that I would tell you is that probably one of the biggest issues we face as a nation and, and biggest has been for a long time is the border crisis. Our southern border is in crisis. It truly is. Just in the month of December, over 300,000 people illegally entered the United States. That's something that's larger than the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Over the last three years, which coincidentally coincides with the duration of the Biden administration, almost the entire population of the state of Washington is coming to this country illegally. We've got to solve that issue. Locally, we've got a lot of things going on too, and I appreciate your partnership working with me to save the state river dams, not necessarily in this day of the world, this administration wants to bring grizzly bears into the state of Washington against state law, just, just as, a, as a side note. Many things that we, we face as challenges in our country, in our local area, I want to make sure Hanford continues to work, important work there. Our agricultural industry continues to be strong, but thank you very much, and I want, I want to ask you humbly to allow me to continue working on your behalf, solving these issues, working against what's literally happening. Chairman, Chairman Bird mentioned this. The, the, the intentional direction that this Democratic Party wants to take us down the socialist path, we cannot let that happen. We cannot. Thank you for your thank partnership. You. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. All right, Mr. Sessler. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is my home. This is my home county. Uh, my name is Jared Sessler. I live in Prosser. Uh, that's where the Sessler Ranch is. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Navy, and I'm a business guy. I've been in business for over 25 years. My background is in engineering. I did used to drive race cars, and uh, I've been married to my wife, who was here in the back for 27 years. We raised and homeschooled three great kids, and I will say that I think I've had a great life. Um, I think one of the things, the qualifications for running for Congress or for representing uh, are very simple in the Constitution, but I think my experience goes well beyond that. And, and to be honest, I, I don't even particularly want to do this, but I think we need some really good representation. I'm going to hopefully be able to touch on some of those things tonight and talk about why. But there, there's, there's an idea in my mind that it comes up, I think it's appropriate to talk about tonight. You know that I'm a veteran, I care about our veterans, and there's, uh, there's lots of reasons why I would want to do this. Um, but the reality is, the elephant in the room is, is why would I oppose 
somebody who is a Republican that's representing this. And so I'm not going to beat around the bush. I won't beat around the bush as a congressman, and I'm not going to do it tonight. What I feel like we need is somebody who will help us to not feel so betrayed. How many of you feel like you're betrayed by our government? I know I do. Things like the news media. I feel betrayed by the news media, and nobody that will speak up about that. Liberal voters, our election system, our justice system, having, having to live with an illegitimate president every single day, and having very, very few people willing to call that out. Idiots in Congress that can't even balance a budget and vote for things that take us out of balance. Out of control inflation, past election officials, big tech, big pharma, the list goes on. Our military leadership, our, our, uh, our, our government, you know, our government officials that say there's something wrong with the state that make America great again. It's wrong. So let me just jump ahead to something here. Uh, as you walked in today, you got a sheet from a representative that says, let's set the record state straight in terms of uh, Dan Newhouse's voting record. There's also a sheet back there and some of my staff are in the back. We didn't want to put it out and put it on your chairs because this is not from the Bet County Republican Party. This is from my team and our research. And it shows what Dan Newhouse's voting record really is, which is the reason why I'm standing up here today. And please don't feel like this is confrontational. Dan Newhouse is a member of Congress. He can handle this. This is his voting record we're talking about. Last month, one of his staff got up and said that I lied on my email where I said that Dan Newhouse voted for a vaccine tracking bill with HR 550. And, and that is also in his material. Thank you, John. That is not true. And I show how he voted for that in my Thank you, Mr. Sessler. Please pass the mic on. All right. Yes. What are we going to do? Well, this is a very exciting opportunity for us. I truly believe that being a nuclear community, that's a unique thing in the United States. Let me tell you, a lot of people are saying, not in our backyard. Most people in, in the Tri-Cities area are, are welcoming an industry that we know can be safe, that we know is proven. We have the expertise, we have all of the infrastructure in place for that bright future that we, we see coming in the new technology of producing energy with nuclear uh, nuclear capability, the small modular reactors, the new technology is safer than anything we've ever seen before. I think that this we are getting a glimpse into what our future looks like. And with that, there are so many other side opportunities that are coming uh, along with that. We are these SMRs, these small modular reactors, and we just have a little bit of time. They can be portable. They can be built here in the Tri Cities and sold to places all over the world that do not have uh, uh, resources to produce energy, do not have the capability, do not have the economic uh, fortitude to be able to, to develop their own resources. This is all of the things that will happen, good things that will happen around the world for because of the, the future of nuclear energy right here in the tri -city. That's just one of the many things that we have on the porch. But real quickly, in order to make that happen, We've got to protect our sleeper our hands, or we're going to lose out on so much opportunity. Thank you. Well, when I think of energy, there's several things I want to talk about there. First of all, energy is probably the biggest driver for our economic problems right now. I don't know about you, but I have a 50 gallon tank in my truck, and it's almost $300 to fill that thing up, especially in this state. I know it's not as bad in other states, but it's very bad here. Uh, so we've got an economic problem. We talk about the Department of Energy, but I just want to point out to start with that our representative voted with the Democrats and with Nancy Pelosi to fund Joe Biden's green agenda to the tune of about $4 trillion through 2025. We, he could have stood against that, but he didn't do it. There are representatives in Congress who did stand against it, but our representative didn't. Now, in terms of, the, in the, the truth is, there is no debt ceiling right now. And that's what our representative voted for. I don't, I don't agree with that. That, that affects our pocketbook. I, I see friends, farmers, uh, thank you to the other county chairs that are here. I talk to the community every single day, and everybody is struggling with finance. As far as the Department of Energy, 
What do they have? You probably know. I think it's about a $40 billion a year budget. For what? They have 13, 14,000 employees. Their original objective was supposed to be to get the United States energy independent. How are they doing? How are they doing? <laughs> Terrible. I need about five people to get us energy independent, or maybe one President Trump to get us energy independent. We have 14,000 employees and a $40 billion a year budget. It's ridiculous. We need to deregulate, decentralize, and defund some of these organizations that are literally driving our country into the ditch. What are your views on climate change and what do you propose to do in response to laws that have been passed in support of climate change? Well, climate change is, uh, in the way that it's presented today, climate change is a hoax. Uh, the whole green movement is a movement to, to tax us to death. It's a movement to steal our money, to uh, hurt our farmers, and to hurt our economy by taking money out of our pockets. Think about this. We don't have this money. Every single time Congress votes to spend money, they pull the United States credit card out of their wallet. And a lot of it, I mean, two weeks ago, this Mr. Hill in the White House hosted, uh, well, I can't remember which country it was, from, uh, from Africa. And they're, they're basically this third world country, they're forcing them to do with all this, all this green energy stuff, you know, and photovoltaic and, and wind energy. This is a, a, a burgeoning country that does not have the money to do this, okay? We're stupid enough to spend our borrowed <laughs> money to subsidize an energy production that isn't even going to do anything for us. And meanwhile, Biden's taking illegitimate money from backdoor, you know, China so that he can entertain countries from Africa so that they will buy photovoltaic from China. And somehow, our members of Congress think that it's okay to talk about kitchen stoves and grizzly bears, which are issues. But, excuse me, what about this illegitimate precedent that we have in the White House? And why are we not chanting about all this stuff every single day until he gets out? And why are we not cinching up the purse strings to close the door on this, these crazy policies that he's, he's uh, using to hurt us and harm us? How would you propose to reduce energy costs in our region? Thank you. So I subscribe to something called the all of the above approach. Um, we have a tremendous amount of energy resources right within our own borders. Did you know up until about almost three years ago to the day, we were an energy independent country. That's no longer the case because of decisions that were made in the Biden administration. On day one, do you remember what he did? Yeah. To stop the XL pipeline construction. And it's been one thing after another every day since. You know, we've got so many resources that we don't have to import energy. We shouldn't have to. But he's forcing us to subsidize those people in the Middle East or in other countries like Venezuela instead of utilizing our own resources right here. Now, I totally believe that. You know, there, there are places when wind power is okay. There's places when solar power is okay. But there's many other things too, like I said, nuclear. And I don't think we should turn our back on fossil fuels either. We can extract, utilize, and produce energy with fossil fuels cleaner and cheaper than anyone else in the world. And we should be doing that. The solution to cheap energy is literally right underneath our <coughs> And we should be doing everything possible to unleash the energy potential that we have in the United States. And I, I'm chairman of something that's called the Congressional Western Caucus. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a group of over 100 members of Congress. And this is one of the primary issues that we focus on every single day. And I've got to tell you, the tar it's a target-rich environment with this administration. They are doing so much to stop energy production in our country that we have to fight tooth and nail for um, permitting, opening up federal lands, all of different things that they're stopping. Construction of pipeline, of tra of pipelines, transmission lines. It's incredible what these people are thinking. And so, but we have the solutions right here within our own borders. Thank you, Congressman. You took 10 seconds from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things is uh, we want. The, the government 
globalists, whatever they want, they want to make everything electric because they can control us with that. They can control the cost, they can control the transmission, they can control the generation, they can regulate it, they can control all that. You know, when you think about all energy comes from the sun, right? But it needs to be converted into a useful tool for us, right? There's two prongs. The second part of the prong has two different prongs. The first prong to reducing the cost of energy in Washington State is Olympia, right? We have idiots in Olympia who are, who are uh, putting in mandates and laws and different things that are causing the cost of our energy to go higher, right? We all know that our price of gas is a dollar or two higher than the rest of the country. Okay, so until we abolish the 17th Amendment and start paying attention to who we send to Olympia, our energy prices are going to be high here in Washington State. Second is federal, right? And federal is divided into two problems. One, who do you have in the White House and what are their policies? Obviously, there's a massive difference in the policies of this illegitimate administration versus the previous administration, President Trump. The second part of that is Congress, and they, they essentially control the purse strings, which is going to cause either inflation or deflation, or the, and what we want is we want the balance, right? We, we, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but it doesn't matter what the cost is as long as our income is commiserate with that, right? So it's okay. One of my favorite places to get a burger is up at Smulligan's in, in Moses Lake, but it's $20 now. Well, when I made all my money, it was on the old economy, probably like a lot of you. And, and right now, spending $20 on a burger sounds like a lot to me, but not if I was making $50 or $70 an hour, right? <clears throat> so it's that balance. And so what we want is people in government who are going to maintain that balance and allow things to balance out so that we can afford our lives. As we get older, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be forced to change our lifestyle, for example, with property taxes, <laughs> which should end at a certain age. We shouldn't be right. We shouldn't be lived out of a lifestyle that we have become used to. Um, question number four, Congressman Newhouse. Name three changes that you would propose to Congress upon being elected. Uh, You've been elected. I feel like we should change that question. Well, go ahead. <laughs> so, three changes. If I had a magic wand and I could change Congress. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, I would. I would, uh, well, you're talking in the real world. See, what I would like to have is a strong Republican majority in the House, a, a strong Republican majority in the Senate, and a Republican in the White House. I think that that's the only way that we're going to solve a lot of the problems that we face as our nation. I cannot tell you the logic behind some of the things that are coming out of this administration, out of the Democrat majority in the Senate. And it's a small majority that we have in the house. We cannot do a lot of things, but depending on who's who's on the floor of that particular day. So we need to this this election, folks. This election coming up this year. Thank you for all of, of, of your activities, the things, your engagement, the precinct caucuses are coming up are so important. You've got to get the right people in office. And I hope people are doing what you're doing around the country. It's so key. But every day. I see the Democrat socialist agenda open wide open for everybody to see. The things that they are trying to force upon this country, it's incredible. The things that they're trying to change in this country. They want the government to be everything, all things, to all people, and they want to tax you to fund them. And that's just not sustainable. Our taxes, it was already mentioned, our debt, $34 trillion. We are going to spend more on um, interest on servicing that debt that we're going to spend on national defense. That's incredible. It's just incredible. We cannot continue down that path. So I would change the spending. I would change the majority. Uh, we've got to get this country back on the right track because, it, folks, it is off the track right now. Thank you, Mr. Chesler. Yeah, this is an unfair question for our current representative because he's had the opportunity to make those changes during his time in Congress, and he hasn't done it. So, we're a representative government, and I'll tell you about three things I'll change after I explain this. When we elect a representative, it's sort of like when you're, you're holding up a sign that says silent to everybody. The only person that can speak for us is our representative. And if you don't hear anything from him on the issues that are important to you, that can be very frustrating. 
going back to my opening. Number one thing I would do, abolish the Department of Education. There's absolutely nothing that, the, <clears throat> that our local school board members cannot do with that $72 billion budget that our Department of Education has. Do you agree? Yeah. That, that bill has been introduced by my friend Thomas Massey from Kentucky multiple times. We can make it happen. Number two, my other friend, another friend, Matt Gates, has introduced single spending bills for Congress. I think we ought to get back to, and I doubt Dan would disagree with this, we got to get back to voting on things individually and actually having the debate. <laughs> Congress where we can try to convince each other across the aisle to vote for things that maybe when we walked into the room we didn't necessarily agree with. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. It'd be a lot more fun to watch C-SPAN if they were doing that instead of having to watch England where they actually have some excitement. The, the third thing is deregulation. We need to deregulate this country and this is just as in federal, this is also on a state level. We are literally just weighted down we're just so, I mean, I've been in business for 25 years. You know, I, I talk to the farmers around here, small business people, restaurant owners. It's a, it's a load right now. And so we need to deregulate both on a state level and a federal level. And I feel like President Trump did a really excellent job of doing that for us. Thank you, Mr. Assistant. What do we do to secure our borders? <laughs> Actually, can, so it actually says, what have you done or will you do? So I changed that for you, but that is the question. What have you done or will you do to secure our border? So it changes any global. Yeah, well, I have been to the border. I've been to actually northern and southern border on multiple trips, and it is a complete disaster. Uh, I think President Trump had a good handle on that in terms of, uh, you know, not doing the marketing campaign that our current administration has done to invite the rest of the world. Do you know we have other countries that are emptying out? I heard this happen in El Salvador. They were emptying out prisons and, and busing those folks up to our border. Are those really the people that we want walking across our border? Those are crimes walking across our border. You can, you, they're humans for sure, but they're not Americans. We have a process for immigration. You need to follow that process. I don't think any of us disagree with that. But there's more to that. There's actually some really good technology out that we could be leveraging. But again, we wouldn't have these massive, you know, migrant groups coming to our border of all 140 different nationalities coming across that border if we weren't just openly advertising that our borders are open. It's just complete lunacy. It puts us at such incredible grave risk that it's, it's really scary. It's number two on my list of things that we absolutely must and have to do in order to secure our country. We have to get that border wall built, and we have to use some of the technologies. They, they, I actually watched a demonstration with Kerry Lake and some other folks down in, in Arizona, and they've got some just amazing uh, tracking where they can actually track individuals, and somehow they tag them digitally, and they can track them as they go out throughout the country. They can continue to track these people, not to mention the fact that we're also giving them I don't know if they still call them Obama phones, but we're still giving them phones. And last I checked, we're all tracked on our phones. You know, so um, so those are some of the things that we can do. I think again, we have to stop advertising that our borders are open, and uh, and we have to secure the borders. And for those of you who don't think we have a problem on the northern border, I've been there. I've talked to CBP. I've met with them. Our Canadian border is completely open. We have a completely socialist country on the north side of us. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. We can fly into and walk across the border. Okay, thank you. So as I said, I think in my opening remarks, the crisis at our southern border and all of our borders, the ocean the shores as well, is the biggest thing that, problem that we have faced in, in a long time. This administration has completely, completely dropped the ball on protecting our borders. So what do we do about that? The House Republicans have already passed something called HR2, and what's that? Last May, we passed essentially the everything Border Patrol need to get back to the policies that were in place in the previous administration. When Joe Biden took the oath of office, he essentially, I think I used this this morning, he essentially turned on a big green neon sign that says open at our southern border. 
We have an influx of people that is unsustainable for the communities in Texas and Arizona and California. Those, thanks to governors like Greg Abbott, those people are now uh, the, the people in Chicago and New York and Denver and other country, uh, cities around the country are experiencing the same pressure that those southern communities are. And I think that's a good thing. We need to get back to those policies that were in place that worked. It wasn't perfect three years ago, but it was a heck of a lot better it is now. We need to stop catch and release. Something you probably haven't heard about for a while. We need to finish the wall. Yeah. We need to, to, to put back into place remain in Mexico. All of those things that were working were proven. Technology is great. We've got to be as smart as possible. We've got to have Border Patrol people down there. We've got to pay them so they stay. We've got to support them. And we've got to hold this administration accountable. Secretary Mayorkas, next week, uh, papers for impeachment will be filed. I hope you know. Congress of Green from Tennessee is determined to hold this administration accountable. And we all, all of us in this room, need to support it. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Congressman Newhouse. Watch. So, Trump, you got it. Uh, so, the, the three biggest threats to our national security. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, our broken border system is atrocious. We, we will not be a nation if we don't secure our borders. We lose control, all of the drugs that are coming across. People on the terrorist watch list have been caught coming across. Who knows how many we have not apprehended? I don't know the answer to that question. So we've got, we've talked about that a lot. We've got to get control of that board. Second, I'm on the select committee on China. China is ubiquitous. They're in everything. Yeah. They have a strategy to take over the world, change the world over. And that, that does not, that future that they have in mind does not include the United States. We have to have a strong defense, as Reagan used to point out. We need to be strong in order to secure our country. So that's, that's number two. And then number three, I gotta tell you, bending, we are, this is something that I want to share. If we pass our Republican budget this year, do you know what, for the first time in modern history, maybe the first time in our country's history, we would be on track to spend less next year than we did last year. Never happened before. We, we are on a tra trajectory of financial ruin. Just try to get your head around $34 trillion in growth. The national debt, is going to weigh down our economy. It's going to make the cost of everything so expensive. We will not be able to spot, survive economically. And then we will fall, we will fall to predators like China, like Russia, like North Korea, like Iran. We've got to take care of business at home as well as all these other things. Now, as you can see, oh, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Sessler. Okay, I'm going to work backwards. I the mic that's working. Is this working? Oh, so I'm going to work backwards just for to make it more interesting. Uh, we definitely have a threat from uh, China. That's that's certainly an issue. Uh, but the third the third one on the list is actually our border. And the reason it's the third on the list is because it's it's a symptom. Obviously, we have lots of problems at the border. We have crimes walking across the border. I totally get that. But what is it a symptom of? Well, we the number two would be globalists, right? And so that would include China, lots of other threats, people that want to see America's demise. Why? Because a strong America is the is the absolute leading indicator of a, of a safer world. And it's the worst thing that globalists want to see. Globalists do not want to see a strong America because that prevents them from their agenda following through. So what's number one? What is our biggest threat that is responsible for the issues that we're having at the border? And that's our internal threat. As Yasek said earlier, our, our biggest problem in this country is our internal dissension. And I call it the demolition party. Uh, if you listen to, to uh, Mark Levin or, or Dennis Prager, they call them leftists. They are destroying our country from within. And we need congressmen, we need an entire Congress that is willing to stand up and say no and not allow this to continue to happen. Now, our congressman just mentioned the budget. 
When he went into office almost 10 years ago, the budget was about a third of what it is today. There is, I do not know of any record, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that a, a spending bill that he had an opportunity to vote for and did not vote to spend. I will not do that. If there's something in that bill that violates our values, I will not vote to spend on that on that issue or on that on that bill. Thank you. Next question for Congressman Ingalls. Are you familiar with the recent gun laws passed in Washington State, and what can you do to address them? So. So the attack on our Second Amendment rights are real. Every time there's a, a shooting in a high school or a, a public place, here come the threats, the determination on the part of the left to take away your, your legal right as a citizen of the United States to carry firearms. And that's real. Uh, don't let anybody fool you. It is. Uh, people want to start with you know, with one little thing, but they want to continue with in, through incrementalism to take them off. And that's just a fact. We have passed many pieces of legislation, and that's why it's so important that we have a Republican majority in, in Washington, D.C. Or, what we fear the most, pecking away at, at our constitutional rights, starting with the Second Amendment, they're gonna, just going to continue on. I have, I have, I'm proud to say I have been a strong Second Amendment uh, supporter my entire time in Congress. I have had the privilege of having the endorsement of the National Rifle Association and many other sporting groups throughout the country um, to, that underscores my commitment to protect our Second Amendment rights as well as our, all of our constitutional rights. Every opportunity through committee work, through, through bills, the legislation that was that is uh, introduced, working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Not every single Democrat wants to take your guns, most of them, but this is a bipartisan effort and I will continue working as hard as I possibly can because there is a concerted effort to chip away at every single right that our forefathers fought for. And we need to make sure that we are ever, ever vigilant that that does not happen. And it starts with the second week. Yes, Mr. Tesla. Okay, so our representative voted for, and this is on my sheet, you can look it up yourself, HR 4350 and 117th Congress to, and to agree to a red flag law which infringed upon our past service members' rights in order to own a firearm. I wouldn't vote for that. Again, I am not, I don't need, I don't really care about my name on the door or I need any notoriety for being a congressman. I'm gonna go there and vote for our principles. And I'm not going to vote for a bill that, that infringes on our Second Amendment. I'm a gun owner. I carry a gun every single day. Uh, I am also a member of the NRA. And uh, I'm just going to I'm going to take a second to explain something. We we are we are as a Republican Party. We are we are fighting for status quo in the middle of a revolution. And, and our Republican representatives are just fighting their tails off for status quo. Okay, let me just, let me just give you the grizzly bear example, which is really stupid, right? We, we probably have, according to our own Washington State uh, Department of Wildlife, well, yeah, Department of Wildlife, we have maybe up to 500 grizzly bears in the state already. They want to release more. Well, my team put together what we call the GDS, it's a grizzly defense system. And it's very simple, and you can get one from us if you want. But it's a simple little card, it gives instructions on how to use it, and it has a little baggie staple to it with a 40 caliber bullet in it. And we hand those out. And frankly, that's the kind of response that we need to these stupid lunatic ideas. Now what is that saying? It's not illegal. It's saying exactly what we are going to do to protect ourselves. If those idiots want to release a grizzly bear in our community, then it's going to get shot because it is going to threaten our lives. And we are humans, and I think it's Genesis 128 says that we're supposed to take dominion Your time is and subdue the earth. Thank you. What do you see as the greatest threats to our growers and farmers in Washington State, and what will you propose to bring support to this industry? 
Ah, I should bring my friend Rob Malikoff up here to answer that question. The biggest threats are uh, regulation. It, farmers are businessmen, okay? The, their biggest asset is their land. Uh, and so, the, you know, just like I was talking about earlier, the, the threat that we have on our small business community is the same as the threat that we have on our farmers. And so we need to deregulate. We need to get off of their backs. And, and I'm just thinking of all the different categories, labor with immigration and cost and the H2 program and all the fees for housing and everything related to that. It's no different than any other business. The other issue obviously is the whole green initiative and trying to shut down carbon, which is really quite interesting. I think we're at like something like 0.4 parts per million currently and they want to get it, they want to cut it in half to like 0.2 which is kind of lunatic because it, at one point it was seven parts per, parts per million. So that's about 15 times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is what it is today. And just so you know, all of the plant life on the planet grows off of carbon and it takes it in. Like I have no idea this, this entire carbon loony whatever, it absolutely discredits people as soon as they start talking about it. They're just dumb. Like, no matter what else comes out of your mouth, I think you just read it off of a Cracker Jacks box. I mean, it just is so lunatic. And so I feel like we need to, we need to deregulate. We need to, we need to say what, say the truth about this whole carbon situation. And of course we have, you know, the, the demands, you know, every, every single farmer, just like any other business is going to have to, you know, become more efficient because of everything that's everything that's going on. You know, we have the threats with all of our fertilizer, you know, sources and types and all that kind of thing. But I believe we'll we'll make improvements to those threats. Thank you. <laughs> so agriculture. I'm a third generation farmer. This is something I know a little bit about. And this question is the reason I ran for office in the beginning. This is why I am your congressman today. What motivated me to enter politics? Because I got sick and tired trying to farm and waking up every single day, and there, there was facing me another reason that I'm breaking the law. Some, some bureaucrat somewhere, some legislator somewhere, uh, they've been passing laws, rules, and regulations with no idea how it impacts uh, farmers' ability to produce food and fiber. So that motivated me to get into politics, to help change that dynamic. This state, I can safely say, I'm not sure Governor Inslee or the state legislature, House or Senate, want an agricultural industry in the state of Washington. They are doing everything possible to destroy agriculture. And this is, folks, this is a national security issue. Do you want to be dependent on foreign sources for our food supply? Oh my gosh, so many, so many problems with that. We could be, we could be manipulated in so many ways if, if China decides to continue buying farmland and controlling any aspect of our food supply chain. We have got to work very hard to prevent that. So this, this is near and dear to my heart. I've got so many friends that are farmers. Rob is one, I guess Jared's friends too, but a lot of people that I know, every community in the 4th District of Central Washington, whether you know it or not, depends on a strong agricultural economy. And our country needs to wake up before one day our food supply is owned by foreign interests and we are unable to compete on the world market. We need research, we need markets, we need availability of tools and cash, all of those things to be yeah, able to be strong. So thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for asking that question. All right, Mr. Jack. What are your thoughts about what's being proposed regarding the lower Snake River dams and what action would you take? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Snake River dams is no longer just an issue for people to discuss. The threat to the existence of those dams is real. The movement, the rhetoric, the talk, the action being taken by this administration to breach those dams, if they had their way, they would start tomorrow. Yep. And that includes our government. Yeah. And we have, this is, 
this is one thing I think we should unite our entire community. And from what I, what I see it does, we get so many benefits from the state program. And let me just tell you this, there's four state river dams on the lower Do you think that the, in the environmental community, trying to be nice here, is going to stop at those four dams? No. Every, everything you read, you can read between the lines. They will not stop until every single river in the Pacific Northwest is free flowing. It will remove the, the best source of clean, renewable, carbon free. I don't get what they're trying to accomplish here. Energy that we that has been able to bring us to the to the economic prosperity that we enjoy here today. And we have got to do everything we possibly can to save those dams. I get criticized in the paper for a lot of things. And one of them is that I won't shut up about the data. And you know what? I'm not going to shut up about the data. So we've got to do everything in our power to save them. And as long as I'm your representative, those dams are still right where they are. Well, Congressman, I do appreciate your voice on that topic, and I, I will give you credit that um, you have used your voice on that. I don't think any of us disagree on that, but once again, we are fighting as a Republican Party for to preserve the status quo while we're facing a revolution. And uh, let me explain why. Uh, very appreciative of both of these guys up here. But neither one of you told neither one of them told you what they are going to do. I have read the documents, I read the 300 pages of information and communications between Congressman Simpson in Idaho, which by the way, it's a really strategic win for him. Who does he irritate in his state by rallying to take out dams in our state? Probably got reelected. Uh, between him and Governor Kingsley and the Governor Morgan. I also read the, the Army Corps of Engineers' plan. Basically what they want to do is they want to dig a trench around the dams because they're not sure about the plan and they want to make sure it works in case they need to fill in those ditches and use the dams. So I got one minute left. Let me tell you what we'll do. All we have to do is take the, I think it's 1973 uh, Endangered Species Act and replicate it for energy. What does the Endangered Species Act does? It identifies a species, it identifies their habitat, and it makes sure that they're protected, right? Well, let's write one of those called the Critical Infrastructure Act and pass it. Okay, so we put our Snake River dams on that, we identify the energy source, we make sure that its habitat is protected, and we make sure it is protected. And really, it's not even just that we're protecting the physical structure. What we're protecting is the output because human flourishing comes from inexpensive energy. Read about Leland Bowles from the 1940s and the 30s and the work that he did to extend the energy. Right now, Idaho Power is installing ballistic fences around their critical infrastructure because they get it. Thank you. All right. What do you see as the greatest concern facing our region now and in the future? Just one? Just <laughs> the greatest one. The greatest, well, gosh, that's hard to pick because, you know, folks, we live in a very, very challenging time. We truly do. Every single thing that we've talked about up here is important to our region. It truly is. We are not immune from inflation, we're not immune from our debt, we're not immune from the threat of China or Russia or any of the other uh, bad actors around the globe. Uh, we're not immune from our own government. We've got to get a handle on our government. This administration has to be held accountable. All of these things, all of these things challenge us and are important to us. So, to pick one, you know, many, many people have said this, and I think it's, it's very true, that the debt that we have accumulated will be the end of the United States of America. I don't want to believe that. I do not want to believe that. All of these other things are absolutely important. But if we, if we collapse economically, everything else is just going to go away we will no longer exist. And ladies and gentlemen, we cannot allow that to happen. We really can. We're trying as hard as we possibly can. In a, in a town that the White House is controlled by the Democrats, the Senate is controlled by the Democrats, 
and we hold a three vote margin in the House. We are trying to bend that spending curve, which I tell you, that's a foreign language in Washington, D.C., a spend less. That's crazy talk as far as a lot of people are concerned. So we need to get a handle on that. We owe it to the next generations so that we can pass on the country that we love so well. Thank you. I don't know if our timer is on. Someone, we lost can, someone. Can you repeat the question? I yeah, what do you see system? as the greatest concern facing our region now and in the future? Yeah, so region, I'm just going to try to narrow it to make it local rather than uh, local or national. Uh, financially, uh, obviously I'm not happy about the national debt. I don't think anybody in D.C. has a, any intent of paying the national debt off. I think that's obvious. The way we spend money is simply ridiculous. Um, but I don't think that's our biggest threat. We produce a lot of things here. We produce a lot of energy here. We grow a lot of things here. We can survive here. There's a lot of other places in the country that have a lot more troubles with regards to the economy and national debt than we are. Uh, the biggest issue really here, and, and I think if you look at Washington's fourth district in general, which, which goes from those of you who know, the Columbia River all the way up to Canada, covers all the part of eight counties, number one issue here is water. And uh, we have got some serious problems with water, and it's not because we have a shortage of water. It's all about policy. We've got policies that are killing our use of water. Talk to any farmer. Go up and visit the farms that are on the uh, just east of Moses Lake in that area. They, they, their families developed that land, started that land. The Columbia Basin Project was started over 70 years ago. We're only 600 and some thousand acres in. That original project was supposed to irrigate over a million acres of land. Uh, we've got regulations that are preventing us from doing that. This stupid addition that they did for $35 million when they added another 10,000 acres, it's just a joke. We have farmers up there that we promised their families generations ago that we were going to bring them water. They're, they started with a couple hundred feet of drilling their wells, then a few hundred feet, then a thousand feet, then 2,500 feet, now 5,000 feet. They're, they're 16 inch diameter running twin 400 horsepower engines pumping water 5,000 feet out of the ground so that they can feed their farms. We have let those families down generation after generation and it doesn't stop there. We've got problems all across this, uh, this region with regards to water. And the thing is, it's all self-induced. It's all regulation based. It's not because we have a shortage of water. And um, I, I was surprised that this question didn't come up earlier because uh, a few years ago, the biggest invasion to our liberty was the uh, COVID lockdown and the vaccine mandate. And even to this day, many are still suffering from the consequences. So, so my question three four. Number one, uh, Dr. Lanapo has clearly published a statement that the current market uh, vaccine contain contaminants of uh, uh, DNA, which is against the FDA's own standard, and therefore all for it to be pulled from the market. Will you currently put pressure on the administration to pull it off? Number two, after your re-election, how will you pressure the next executive, the president, to make reckoning of those who are responsible for this uh, challenge? And number three, if the Congress is the only branch the Republican controls, what effective means do you have to bring this to pass? Thank you. Well, thank you, Danny. Hand me the microphone in the middle of that. Um, so I'm, I'm pure blood. Uh, I totally disagree with the mandates. Uh, I think the vaccine is very unsafe. I follow uh, Steve Kirsch and uh, Jeff Childers, who writes the COVID Coffee. I follow that. I'm very frustrated with our rights as citizens being violated in regards to this whole thing. Uh, that's beyond all of the stupid mask mandates and which I did not wear a mask. The only thing, the only time I did was when I absolutely was forced to, to get on an airplane. So irritating. Uh, lots of people yelled at me and stuff, but, um, but yeah, we, we, again, we're Republicans trying to fight for the status quo in the middle of the revolution. And, uh, until we're willing to stand up together and, you know, if you read the declaration of independence, it clearly says that we won't actually stand together until the tyranny becomes insufferable. So I guess, you know, when it becomes insufferable, more of us will stand up, stand together, but I'll just tell you what my vision is, is I want to be a conservative voice for Washington State. 
Most of the elections, especially the uh, statewide elections, are very, very difficult in the state because of our uh, lack of integrity in our, our election system. This district is the most conservative district in the state. It's the, one of the most conservatives in the country and certainly the most conservative on the West Coast. And we deserve to have somebody who has a strong conservative voice, a, a Matt Gates, a Marjorie Taylor Greene, an Andy Biggs, you know, a Chip Roy, somebody who is very, very conservative is going to fight and be vocal. Okay, and, and that's what I'm fighting for, and that's the reason why I'm here. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that you've seen enough tonight to know that I'm not just going to use my voice. I'm going to be creative and find ways to make sure that, that the, the solutions are, or the problems actually have solutions and not just the voice. The voice is great. I want the voice. But I also want uh, solutions with integrity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that very important question. Let's make a deal tonight. Let's never go through this again. Yeah, yeah. The, the shutdowns, the, the mistakes that were made because of COVID, the, the people that were lost, the students that were left behind, so many things. We had a governor who was the last one in the country to give up his dictatorial emergency power. Uh, we can never put our country through this again. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of in the 118th Congress is the exercising the atrophy muscle of accountability on the part of Congress. We are what do you see as the greatest threats to our growers and farmers in Washington State, and what will you propose to bring support to this industry? Oh, I should bring my friend Rob Malikoff up here to answer that question. The biggest threats our uh, regulation. It, farmers are businessmen, okay? The, their biggest asset is their land. Uh, and so, the, you know, just like I was talking about earlier, the, the threat that we have on our small business community is the same as the threat that we have on our farmers. And so we need to deregulate. We need to get off of their backs. And, and I'm just thinking of all the different categories, labor with immigration and cost and the H2 grader program and all the fees for housing and everything related to that. But it's no different than any other business. The other issue, obviously, is the whole green initiative and trying to shut down carbon, which is really quite interesting. I think we're at like something like 0.4 parts per million currently, and they want to get it, they want to cut it in half to like 0.2, which is kind of lunatic, lunatic because it, at one point it was seven parts per parts per million, so that's about 15 times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is what it is today. And just so you know, all of the plant life on the planet grows off of carbon, and it takes it in. Like, I have no idea, this this entire carbon, loony, whatever, it absolutely discredits people as soon as they start talking about it. They're just dumb. Like, no matter what else comes out of your mouth, I think you just read it off of a Cracker Jacks box. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just is so lunatic, and so I feel like we need to we need to deregulate. We need to, we need to say what say the truth about this whole carbon situation. And of course, we have you know the, the demands. You know, every every single farmer, just like any other business, is going to have to you know become more efficient because of everything that's everything that's going on. You know, we have the threats with all of our fertilizer you know, sources and types and all that kind of thing, but I believe we'll, we'll make improvements to those threats. Thank you. Those wages stay So the costs are not going to come down. The question is, is can we increase our income? And I think one of the biggest threats for the Northwest, and you included, is exports. When it comes to President Trump, he did an excellent job of trying to balance exports. Why did he use agriculture? Did anybody ever think about that? Why did he work on agriculture so much? Because it's the one thing in America that we still do really, really well. We don't have a lot of manufacturing, we should. We don't have a lot of mining and, and processing of our minerals and, and building those and manufacturing those into a finished product, we should, but we still do agriculture and we do it really, really well. So I hope that answers your question. You and many other farmers have helped me a lot in order to understand this, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, it seems like we play too much defense and not enough offense. We're always got back against the wall. We're, we're trying to fight with it. We're fighting. We send you the bullet points to change the H2A program 
similar to what the H2B program is, which they pay for everything for yes. us. Will you yes. sponsor that bill and yes. have your bill writer write that bill? That was the question. Yes. Her answer for me is yes. Thank you. It's your time. Uh, I want to say thank you, Annette, for a great job. Thank you, Chairman Bird, for putting this together. And thank all of you for attending. I think it was a very well or time long well worth spent. Um, interestingly, while I was the Director of Agriculture, I brought to the governor the idea of allowing prisoners out to pick apples, and guess what? We did. So that's a great idea, and I would, I would suggest doing that again. But I want to, I want to just, uh, besides thanking you for this evening, and thanks for the great questions, and I hope you learned a lot tonight, uh, just to remind you the honor that you have placed on my shoulders to be your representative is something I take very, very seriously. Every decision I make, whether you agree with me or not, you can rest assured that I don't make decisions like that. And we do have a lot of challenges in this country. We have a lot of challenges in, in our district. And it's a very diverse district, one that I'm very proud to have been born in, have had my family here, my business here, and I expect I will die. This is my home. The issues that you face, guess what? They're my issues too. I understand them. And I want to make sure that this area, this part of our city, this part of our country, our entire country, is better because of the work that we did together. And I want to continue to be your voice to make sure that that bright future happens. Like I said, we you know, a lot of a lot of challenges, but we have a war going on in Washington D.C. against liberalism and conservatism. And I want to continue helping to lead the charge to make sure our conservative agenda prevails. We cannot afford going down the road of socialism where the, where the Democrats want to take us. It is not sustainable. We've seen that. We, do, we cannot let that happen. So as you meet as the precincts coming up soon, you put together your platform, you think about some of those things. Your voice will help others gain their voice we can actually send more people to Congress that have that same determination to get these things done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. I'll also like to thank everyone for coming and spending the night here this evening and listening to us and bantering. And uh, thank you to my family and friends and to Annette and, and everybody that was a part of putting this on. I, my wife asked me earlier today how I was doing. And uh, I, was, I was sitting and I said, you know, I'm feeling inadequate. And, but I clarified, I said, it's not because of who I'm going to be standing on the stage with. It's because I understand the responsibility that God has given us in order to put it to be in a position like this, or potentially be in a position like this. And so I want you to know, uh, I've only, I've only, I only have one position for my throttle in life. And I need something that's full throttle. And uh, I'll be the best congressman that you've ever had in this district. Uh, choose to support you. A couple of items. Number one, uh, I would be interested in knowing why our congressman missed almost 20% of his votes in the fourth quarter last year. That's a significant increase to what his past record has been. And um, also, just in case those of you who don't know, there was another uh, January 6th prisoner who was arrested here in Washington State uh, just this last week. That makes 23 in our state. I've talked to many of them. I don't know if our congressman's talking to him. I know we mentioned earlier he's helping working with Jim Jordan, but I just have never heard anything from him on that whole issue. It's very important to me because I was there. And uh, the FBI couldn't come and arrest me any day. I was there. I was I didn't go inside the building, but I was on the property and I was watching what was going on. I was there for a couple of days and and so that's a big issue to me. Uh, now another one, another issue that I read that you guys may have seen that our representative is an amazing investor. Uh, this last week came out that he beats the S&P 500 by about 200%, and he has consistently for some years. Uh, according to uh, online sources, his net worth has increased radically in the 10 years of the Congress, somewhere from the neighborhood of around a million dollars to something like $27 million. Those are estimates online. I don't know if that's accurate, but I would love to know how you do that uh, in a legal way, making whatever $170,000 a year. 
let me just wrap up with this. Number one, uh, the PCOs, your representatives of your people, and the people of Washington's home district have already made a decision. In the last election, 66% of them voted for somebody other than our current representative. But because we had such a crowded field, our congressman was able to get another, another term. And we really want to do that again. We want to set us up to have that situation again, especially knowing that most likely President Trump will be back in the White House. The truth is, it's in your hands. We all felt the ripple effect that went across this country when Liz Cheney was ousted in Wyoming. The truth is, Dan Newhouse's election results from the last primary were worse than what Liz Cheney's were. That ripple effect was encouraging for the whole country. You, as a county, have an opportunity to send that same ripple effect across the country by endorsing the Congress.